so, um, you know, we've been, we've been talking about what we're cultivating and what God is cultivating as we look at what it means to be a people who follow Jesus, we've looked at what it means to walk by the Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so really another way of saying that is what is the shape of a life in the aftermath of the explosion of grace? What is a life that has been shaped by the grace of God look like, smell like, feel like? What is a church that is walking by the Spirit doing? How do you see the realities of grace? There's this intangible reality of God's transformation that manifests itself in these ways that nourish our souls and the souls of the people around us. And we've gone through and we've examined some of those fruits. And I think today we're going to unpack what I really believe is this foundational misunderstanding we have about who God is because we think that God works the way that we do. And so we've looked at the fruit of the Spirit, that as we're walking in the transformation of Jesus, we see kindness blossom in our lives. We see patience blossom in our lives. We see goodness blossom in our lives. Today we're gonna we're gonna dig into we're gonna dig into something that's difficult for us because it's not the way we operate. So let me tell you why I will never walk into a haircut. Um, franchise again. I'm going to go ahead and call it game clips for legal reasons, because I'm about to tell you a story that could potentially be litigious, okay? So when we still lived in Indiana, it was spring break. Our kids were not in school. It's important, because the only place I took my oldest son, Ethan, was to game clips. So we go, and we get his hair cut, and he comes home, and the next day he wakes up, and his head is itchy, and there's lice in his hair. It didn't come from school, It didn't come from me. It did not come from my wife. It didn't even come from his little brother because no one else in the house had lice. The only thing that was different about Ethan's life was game clips. (laughs) Um, I will never go back into one of those again. We, to this day, have never set foot back in that place again, and here's why. Because I had to deal with them. I said, listen, I'm going to give you some money you're gonna cut my child's hair and he's gonna leave with a haircut and without parasites. That's it, very simple. If they have an inability to live up to a basic level of competency, I no longer want to be associated with this franchise. Lice are not good, they're not healthy, they're certainly not what I signed up for. And if they don't have the ability to be a disease-free establishment, then I, I just don't want to do business with them. They did not fulfill their end of the contract. So I now go elsewhere for my haircutting needs. And every time I drive by game clips, I I shiver a little bit and wonder how that happens. So the reason that I think this is connected to our spirituality and our understanding of God is because everything about what I just told you makes perfect sense. Because we live and operate in a system that is very much dependent on people fulfilling their end of the bargain. It's, it's basically how capitalism works. This is not an anti-capitalist sermon. Please don't panic. Simply the reality of capitalism says, if you do not do what you say you're going to do, the market will kill you. Unless you are of a certain size to spend a certain amount of money on lobbying, then the government will bail you out. But for everyone else, they would say, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, the market will take care of you. And that resonates with our flesh on a very deep level because we would say that our faithfulness is conditional. And when we see that faithfulness is a fruit of the Spirit, we instantly want to run that idea of faithfulness through the grid of humanity. Where we say, sure, we're faithful if, we're faithful if people are doing things the right way. We're faithful if people are meeting our needs. We're faithful if I get what I want, if I'm comfortable. And it makes perfect, that's logical. No one bats an eyelash at that. It makes perfect sense. Unfortunately, what begins to happen in us so often is when we begin to address this concept of faithfulness through a human grid, we start to try to apply that to God. And it creates these lies that we believe about who God is and what it means for us to be beloved by him. And we we, kind of take what I'm going to call the game clips method and apply that to how our father sees us. And we begin to twist our understanding of what it means to be a child of God. And so this overflow of our heart, instead of being rooted in the truth of who God is, begins to be rooted into the kind of contractual capitalistic model that we live in. 
And we say, God will love me if I do what I'm supposed to do. God will love me if I'm good enough. God will love me if I write a check to the church or if I serve or if I don't cuss or if I don't look at porn or if I'm not doing drugs or if I'm not angry or, I mean, whatever. Like, there's a million different things. If I don't watch um, Tottenham Hotspur and root for them, that's for you, David, just to take home with you, right? Like, so there's all of these ifs that we start to apply to God. And as those lies take root in our heart, then the overflow and fruit of our lives is not the faithfulness of the Father, but rather the insecure, performance-driven faithlessness of the world that we live in. And this isn't a new problem, right? So open your Bibles to the book of Hosea. I did not think about this colliding with Mother's Day when I planned this in January, so I get that this is weird. But um, God, through the prophet Hosea, is going to teach his people about who he is. And so a little bit of background on the book of Hosea. This is, this is sort of the twilight of, of um, God's kingdom as a political force in, in the Levantine area of the ancient Near East. And God's people were rife with faithlessness. They had left the reality of who God had called them and made them, and they had begun to worship every other God under the sun. Because, listen, they had this belief that God wasn't doing his job, so they needed to find other gods who would if, if God who provided for them wasn't giving them what they wanted, then they would just go elsewhere. And they went to fertility idols and weather idols and war idols. There, were, there was one big one named Baal, who was a fertility idol that was wildly popular in that area. And they could not stop leaving the reality of who God was to seek salvation in other places. And so through his prophets, God would continually try to teach his people the truth of who he was. And he would use a lot of different means to teach them this. And listen, some of them are weird. Like you had prophets running around the city with no clothes on. You had them building model cities out of their own poop. Like it really is, is not ways that we would probably do object lessons in, in an evangelical church today. But through these messages, God is constantly showing his people the truth about who he is and how that leads to their salvation. So here's the question that we're going to answer in Hosea today. Day. What is faithfulness? What does that mean? If faithfulness is the fruit of the Spirit, what does faithfulness look like? If we want to know what faithfulness looks like, we don't go to ourselves. We go to our Father. What does the faithfulness of God look like? So here's what he said to Hosea, because we're, we're picking up in the middle in chapter 3. He basically went to Hosea and said, hey, I want you to go, and I want you to marry a woman. Um, I'm just doing an age check in the room here. Who was of a less than honorable profession? Um, a lady of the evening, okay? And so I want you to go and marry this woman, and I want you to do that knowing that she has not been legally faithful in the way that the law would have prescribed at the time. And I want you to do this knowing that she will be continually unfaithful to you. And so he's really using some intentional language here because everything that God does with us is a mirror of how he loves us. And when God first made his people his people, he did it with what was called a covenant. That was a legal agreement. That was a treaty between God and his people where he said, if you will be my people, I will be your God. If you worship me, everything will go well in the land for you. You will flourish and you will thrive. It was the Mosaic covenant. He made this covenant with Moses. And he said, if you do this, then this will happen. It was a legal agreement God made with his people. In the same way, he's calling Hosea to enter a legal agreement with this woman. Her name is Gomer. And I know if you're an Andy Griffith fan, this is a weird picture that's in your mind right now. Different person. So he went to this woman, Gomer, and made a legal agreement with her. A marriage in that time was a legal covenant. It was intentionally a very similar dynamic that God had entered with his people. He said, hey, you know that agreement that we made? This is kind of like that. I want you to see what this is like. She said, go make a legal agreement with a woman who I guarantee you is going to make this legal agreement completely null and void with her actions. You're going to make this agreement with a woman who will break it. She will leave you. She will cheat on you. She will be unfaithful to you. She is going to break every promise that she made to you. And the reason I want you to do that is because I want people to understand this is how you have treated me as your God. I made this agreement with you knowing you would break every promise that you made. But I still made this agreement with you. So, as we kind of go through the story, sure enough, everything that God said happened. Hosea went and made, 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 um, made a legal marriage agreement with this woman. They had children who were all named after various um, 
indiscretions that the Israelites had committed. And sure enough, she found herself back in the house of another man. And there's a few different interpretive um, options that we have in terms of how did she end up there. Some people would say it was like a Western affair. You know, when I say Western, I don't mean cowboy hat. I mean like philosophical, like Western affair. Like, hey, I met this person at work. They finally understand me and I'm just in love with this new person. Other people say that she had gone back to her previous profession. Other people say that she has entered some sort of a, um, like indentured servitude. Does that make sense? So those are sort of the three interpretive perspectives as to how she is where she is. They all basically paint the same picture though. It's someone who had been redeemed and entered into an agreement that had left and found themselves back and enslaved and oppressed just like they were when they started. And so God says, this is like my people. Then in chapter three, he says, this is what you're gonna do. So let's pick it up in chapter three, verse one. And the Lord said to me, me is obviously the prophet Hosea, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. Let's talk about that because that's a weird last detail. Why is that a problem? Is God anti-sun ray? Like, what is this? So um, when they would worship Baal, one of the primary functions of that worship in the temple was they would actually have these raisin cakes that would be made, and the raisin cakes were really representative of the fruits that happened through the worship of Baal, right? So think about, like, um, think about the prosperity gospel today. People would say, hey, if you give God a bunch of money, then he's going to 10x your return. It's like crypto, but better, right? And so they would say that that money that you got back from God, from this false prosperity God, is the fruit of that worship. This was the same thing with a raisin cake. And this, this represented fertility. This represented blessings. There, there was kind of a, a spectrum of spiritual representation in the raisin cake. So when he's saying they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes, what he's really trying to say is they've turned to other gods and love the fruits of the false promises that the other gods had given them. He said, this is what my people have done to me. They've left me. They've said all of the other things that the world has to offer is better than you, Lord. I want this. And so he says, in the midst of a people like that, go and love her. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver in a homer and a lecteth of barley. Let's talk about that for a second too because it was this, anytime we're talking about buying people, especially a man buying a woman that's sensitive, so we need to unpack this. This, this shouldn't be used in, in some misguided attempts to demean women or, or set men as dominators over women. So when he's saying buy, can we talk about this for a second? There, there's again a few different options here and none of, them, none of them are supposed to be demeaning to the woman. One of the ways in which buy could be communicated in the context of this passage is that it is a wedding dowry that he's having to re-engage this legal agreement where he's done the dowry once where he's paid. Now he has to go and pay again. Number two is that she's been in indentured servitude and now he's having to go and redeem or buy her out of the situation that she's gotten into. This is not God advocating that we buy people. I just, I want to, I don't think anybody's there, but just so we're crystal on that, okay? And so he says, listen, I went and got and redeemed her from where she was. So here's what's crazy about about this. And this is the first picture of God's faithfulness that you see. Surely we know where this is headed, right? Like we know what the New Testament parallel is. And, and just so we're not confused, we know who all of us are, man and woman in this story, right? We're not Hosea. Okay, so listen, what we see here is that faithfulness is not conditional. The faithfulness of God is not conditional on behavior because in this story, Hosea is representative of God. Gomer is representative of people. When did he go and redeem her? Was it when she had repented and she had gone back to church and she had covered up the tattoos? And like, when, when, when did that happen? When she was still in a place where she was in the midst of sin and rejection of the agreement that she had made. Redemption didn't happen after she cleaned her life up, redemption happened in the midst of sin because God is faithful even in the midst of our sin. Think about in Ephesians 2. What is, what is Ephesians 2 write about our salvation? Even when we were what? Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he died for us. Not once we had cleaned up, not once we had fill in whatever blank that we think, oh God, I'm not good enough because I didn't live up to your like Whatever your version of giving somebody lice at a haircut place is, God doesn't wait until after you've gotten lice free to step in and clean you up. God's faithfulness means that he redeems us without condition. God's love for his people 
God's desire to save us from our sins, God's sacrifice for us is not conditional on our behavior. And my concern is I think it's so easy in our hearts for us to shy away from intimacy with the Father and feel like we can't sit in his presence or worship him in freedom or be known by him because we haven't met the conditions that would make us acceptable to him. And this is why faithfulness is such a powerful fruit of the Spirit, because when we don't understand God's faithfulness, we don't enter his presence with freedom because we think it's somehow based on how we behave. Does God give us instructions for behavior? For sure, right? Like, it's good for us to be obedient to God. Those commandments are for our joy. Those, the, the obedience doesn't make you good. The obedience is an overflow of the goodness that has been put in us by Jesus Christ. So obedience is good. This is not anti-obedience. Like, God's commandments are good. God's commandments are good. But God's faithfulness is not conditional on your ability to obey him. Because if it was, nobody measures up. We've all sinned. We've all sinned today. Maybe less likely on a Sunday morning drive. You know, during the week, though, for sure, when you get in the car. Didn't know there's a vice presidential visit happening in 285. But anyways, that just that was my sin this week. Um, so listen, God's faithfulness is not conditional on your behavior. That's what this section of this story is supposed to hammer home to you in a very borderline offensive to the point where like we need to probably PG the text way. God's faithfulness is not dependent on you. God's faithfulness is dependent on him. So when we talk about walking in the fruit of the Spirit, when we talk about faithfulness, when we talk about God transforming our hearts, when we have experienced that faithfulness, it changes the way that we're faithful to other people. It changes how we view the relationships that we have. It changes what conditional love looks like. Not conditional boundaries, conditional love. It changes the way that we view what a commitment is because we understand what faithfulness is. God's shown us a different way. The magnitude of his love for his people did not wait for them to make the first move. God initiated in the midst and depth of sin to rescue his people. Let's keep going here. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not be who you were or belong to another man, so I will also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Okay, so let's just stop there for a second. So he goes to her and says, as an outworking of this redemption, you will go back and live in my house as my wife. You are restored to who you are despite the fact that you left. You will be faithful to me, and I will be faithful to you. The past is forgotten. So here's, here's the outworking of this that I think is really important, because we always want to focus on God and Hosea. And generally, when we look at Gomer, I think we, because that's who we're supposed to identify with, we struggle to really get in deep with her. Because it just, oh, well, this is what not to do. Again, very extreme example, um, culturally for us as sin, to say, oh, that's really bad. We don't want to do that. <sighs> But we miss this other layer with her. Um, we miss maybe what, what she felt like in that space. And that's not to excuse sin. It's just, I think because we are her, it's important that we understand this. One of the lies that we believe in the midst of our sin and unfaithfulness that causes us to flinch away from the grace of God is that we don't confront and deal with the shame and the reality that we have and we just hide. So if you think about what she felt like, here's somebody that based on either profession, behavior, whatever, would not have been spoken and treated kindly by society. She would have been rejected socially. She would have had very little to her name, very little rights. Her life was the definition of hopeless. That's who God came to save. Faithfulness is comes for the weak and the broken. Faithfulness doesn't come for the strong and the wealthy. Faithfulness doesn't come for the accomplished and the acclaimed. Faithfulness doesn't come for the winners of life's game. Faithfulness comes for the lost and the hurting. So often as an outworking of our contractual mind, we're like, well, God's faithfulness is for the people that are really good because they've earned it. Even though like we can say we don't believe that something in us is like the goodness of God is really for the people that are really good. 
And if you're hurting, if you're broken, if you're lost, if you, if you have just shame covering your past, well, that's not for me. That's not for me. I don't qualify for the goodness and gracefulness of God because whatever. And so we hide, we, we build kind of this false idea of who God is and who we are. We find these ways to try to overcome um, just kind of the existential, man, I don't know, almost like an existential mediocrity that we feel like we're drowning in. We're like, man, I'm not one of those people. I didn't do it right. My life doesn't look like that. It can't be for me. I'm exempt because of my failures from, from God's faithfulness. And God says, that's not what faithfulness is. Faithfulness redeems the lost and the hurting continually throughout scripture, you see God go to the very people that our society tends to want to marginalize and forget about. In so many of the stories of God's goodness in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the people that are encountering it firsthand are the people that literally have no other hope. For whatever reason, whether it's economics, whether it's social standing, whether it was because of their gender or ethnicity or whatever, God's continually confronting these people with absolutely nothing at the lowest possible rung of humanity and showing them the depth and the magnitude of his faithfulness and his goodness. God's continually communicating to us, faithfulness redeems everyone. There is no one who is beneath too bad, too lost, too incompetent, too evil to experience the faithfulness of God because the depth of his goodness overcomes the depths of evil and sin. So the faithfulness of God redeems those that are lost and hurting. That's us. That's us. I think a secondary lie we tend to believe in this is that we're the only ones that are lost and hurting, and maybe the people that look like they have it all together, they're fine, right? And Instagram, I think, has probably just reinforced that a little bit. And so it's important to remember that at the end of the day, he's not saying the people at the top get nothing and the people at the bottom get everything. He's saying everyone's actually at the bottom. Just to really level the playing field, there is no one, because we live in a broken world that has been unscarred by sin, that has been untouched by failure, and that has been unbroken either by their own sin or the sin of the people around them. But God's faithfulness says when we are in the midst of our shame and our failure and our imperfections and our hopelessness, he still pursues us and redeems us. Even and especially when we don't think we deserve it, God is stepping towards us and saying, this is what my love looks like, and this is what salvation means, and this is transformation, and this is hope, and this is love. And so for us, as we think about that, if, if God is a God who redeems the lost and the hurting, starting with us, what does it look like for us to be a people that reflect that reality? How do we as individuals in a church redeem the lost and the hurting? Where are there opportunities for us to step into proximity with those who are being oppressed by injustice? Where those who have experienced loss or failure or sin, where there are people who have said, I am not worthy of being loved by God, where is there opportunity for us to step towards that and be an incarnational picture of God's love and hope to them? Where does it happen for us? A transformed church is going to reflect God's faithfulness to the lost and the hurting. We haven't been called to like a weird spiritual Reaganomics. It's like, okay, if we get the rich and popular people, that's going to trickle down. Like, you understand, like, that doesn't work, right? That, that's not the gospel of Jesus. He did that very, very upside down. As a church, we don't ever want to be a pyramid scheme for Jesus. We want to be a church who reflects the love and faithfulness of God to the lost and the hurting, wherever we find them. In our backyard, across the world, across the country, we want to be a church that is aware of those places where there are lost and hurting people that need to experience the depth of the faithfulness of God. God has chosen to include us in his plan to do that. It's very difficult for us to reflect a faithfulness that we haven't experienced, and that's why it starts with us sitting and experiencing the reality of how God has been faithful to us when we are lost and we're hurting. And I've, I've talked about this a lot. I think for me it was so difficult, is, I say was, like I've had conversations with my wife this week, so difficult for me to really dig into this because for me so long I felt like I was sort of exempt from God's goodness um, 
for a lot of different reasons. But like growing up, I think one of my reactions to brokenness, and everybody does a little bit different, mine was mostly blind rage. And so I was, I was someone who, who had what you would call some rough edges. And it was just very difficult for me to want to get close and let people in. And so I would always think because of that, I don't quite fit into God's plan of faithfulness because I'm kind of the, the angry person. I'm the bad person. I'm, I'm the person that people don't like. And there's those lies that I can believe about myself that I slowly start to believe, well, God believes that about me too. And when I'm stuck in that place, I'm not looking to reflect the faithfulness of God to people because I'm not understanding it for myself. And I don't know what those spaces are for you, but those are the spaces that we tend to want to find and hide from God in. And scripture here is not condemning us. It is inviting us into experience the goodness of a God who redeems us in the midst of our sin and says, come back and live in my house. Come back and be with me like before. Your sin's been covered and dealt with, right? So let's, let's go on and see this last anchor point that we have for what faithfulness looks like when we see the faithful, faithfulness of our father. He says, afterward... The children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. He's saying there is a day coming that my people will return to the reality of who I am. And as Christians, here's how we understand the way that this fits into what we know about who God is. All of this is pointing to the person work of Jesus Christ. The lineage of David returning to the Lord, God's people coming back to him, is rooted in the reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. A descendant of David who called God's people back to himself. And we see the arc of history throughout the Old and New Testament where God's people come into this, continually real, this continual realization of the truth of who God is and what it means to know him. And it culminates in Jesus Christ. Faithfulness keeps his promises. From the beginning of time, God promised his people a savior. That savior arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. It's why we celebrate Christmas. That savior died on the cross for our sins and rose again so that we may be made new and have eternal life. That's why we celebrate Easter. The foundation of our faith is that we have a God who keeps his promises. Faithfulness does what it says. We have a God who keeps his promises. In the midst of our inability to hold up our end of the bargain, God keeps his promises. The fundamental place we see God keep his promises on the cross. And so we do experience that with communion. This is supposed to be experiential. This gets us out of our seats and out of our brains and moves us into our body where we're touching and tasting the reality of what it means to be loved and pursued by God that through his death and resurrection, we have hope and salvation and peace. We have a faithful father who has secured us to himself by his love. We have a God who has sacrificed himself so we can live. Faithfulness keeps his promises. This was hundreds of years before Jesus Christ. God was planting the seeds of the promises of Jesus for his people. And we can touch and taste the fruits of the promises of Jesus. And as we do that, we see faithfulness begin to blossom in our life. The more we are rooted in the faithfulness of God, the more that we will be a people who are faithful to those around us because God shifts our understanding of what that means. It's not about us and our ability to be good enough. It's about a God who pursues us when we're far away. And as we lean into that, we, we become a people where forgiveness and love blossom. We become a people who pursue those who are far from God. And we become a people who are secure in God's love for us in a way that we are confidently loving of the people around us. So as we continue to lean into this reality today, would you pray with me as we begin to celebrate communion? God, we just thank you for your word and the reality that you are a God who is faithful. You show up for your people. You rescue us from our sin. You come alongside us in our hurt. You mend us where we're broken. And you promise us eternal life that can only be found in you. And God, we pray that we would continue to step into the depth of what it means to be known and loved by you. God, we pray that we would continue to experience your love and faithfulness in our life in the ways that you've forgiven us in the ways that you have brought us into your family and in the ways that you have called us to be your children. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.